I think what what we do now is is that we'll ask Stephen Holgate to to um, um, uh, give some reflections, uh, and those watching uh, while you're listening, um, it would be great if you also could think of uh, one or two comments or questions of your own to put in. Uh, otherwise, I've got questions, uh, but I'd rather hear other people's than mine. Um, Stephen, are you uh, uh, Stephen? Are you all Thank right? You. Taking over. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. And Hilary, that was super, absolutely brilliant. So thanks for that. I, in fact, gave uh, the medical evidence to the Ella Kissy Deborah case that uh, led to her uh, second inquest where air pollution was uh, uh, stated uh, as a major driver, not only to her death from asthma, but the origins and progression of her asthma over two and a half years of, the, of her life. And I think it makes the point, Hilary, that uh, you made, that personal experience um, speaks far louder in many cases than more and more epidemiology, because we know from population health studies that air pollution damages human health. Uh, but I think when you start getting the personal experience coming through, as Rosamond Kissy Deborah so uh, avidly illustrated uh, following the death of her daughter uh, it really does you know shout that in our local communities we do have people like this and I think what we need as health professionals uh, is to try and look out for some of these case studies because as you correctly pointed out translating uh, people's personal experience into a wider context through these case stories is incredibly powerful and something that we've uh, uh, had lacking in this area. The second point I wanted to make is that poor air quality is not just uh, an issue outside um, in the outdoor air. It's inside and in inside buildings and in particular inside our homes. And as we start to push policies to preserve energy for obvious reasons. The tightening up of our homes and the ceiling of our homes leads to potentially an accumulation of air pollutants in the indoor setting, which can become really quite problematic, particularly in overcrowded homes and in those living close to um, highways and, and other areas where air pollution can be trapped. And so the point I wanted to make from this, Hilary, is that we should be exploring the co-benefits of cleaning up the air with the uh, short-lived climate pollutants, giving almost 50% of the benefits for climate change, which of course will take years to emerge, uh, but at the same time give enormous health benefits, particularly in cardiovascular and respiratory health. So. I haven't witnessed really a real effort to bring these two fields together and they've developed quite separately in, in the way that they've emerged and I think as health professionals one thing we could do is to draw these two things together. The third point if I can just finish on this is that the health professional uh, was the professional that created the tobacco smoke legislation, no question about it. It was the health professionals getting behind the issues on the basis of the evidence. But do I see health professionals engaged and advocates in outdoor indoor air pollution? Not at all. Yet they're the very ones treating the diseases that this particular um, pollution contaminants uh, lead to um, so much adverse misery and, and, and problems and then accelerated deaths in in our society. So I would like health professionals, in addition to the green agenda, to start beginning to embrace air quality as, and you used the term I think, or, or it was used earlier on, the environmental, uh, the greatest environmental cause of adverse health, and start coming behind this uh, in a coherent, joined up manner to help people understand what the nature of the problem with to help people connect it with climate change and to advise patients and carers how they themselves can contribute to improving the climate that we're all currently living in. Mm -hmm.